morning, Steve. Uh, I'm very glad uh, that I have the opportunity to interview you. We are here on the Congress Reden Reicht Nicht, where you are one of the main speakers because of uh, uh, your so important work with the polyvagal theory. For my, in my own uh, uh, work uh, as a psychotherapist, mm. but also counselor and organizations, uh, your theories and your research work have been very important over the years. So I would uh, ask you to just, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, so mm. draw uh, what is the main issue of your theory in, <laughs> in this short term? Well, first, thank you for inviting me to the Congress and thank you for interviewing mm. me. Now, whenever I'm asked the question, what is the polyvagal theory? My eyes open up and my eyes roll back <laughs> because I first ask, how much time do we have? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then I creatively will try to summarize it in a few sentences. Mm -hmm. uh, the polyvagal theory really is the understanding of how our body reacts to various challenges and that we ha our reactions are really based on the evolution of our autonomic nervous system. And what that really means is that our evolutionary history as vertebrates, during that history, the autonomic nervous system changed. And as it changed, it created different circuits. And those circuits function in a hierarchy, meaning there, the newer circuits can inhibit older circuits. But the older circuits were circuits of defense. So in terms of models of psychotherapy or psychosomatic medicine, what we start understanding is that most diseases, including chronic diseases of physical health, are really diseases of the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system uh, changes with mental health as well. So what we find with polyvagal theory is that our reactions to the world follow this evolutionary pattern in which the newest circuit is a circuit of social interaction, mm -hmm. which is linked to a uniquely mammalian vagal pathway, which is a nerve going from the brainstem to the heart. And this nerve is linked in the brainstem to the muscles, the nerves that regulate the muscles of the face and head. So when you invited me to talk at a conference that was called When Talking Is Not Enough, it was really, to me, an opportunity to talk about the polyvagal theory and the social engagement system which really is the neuroregulation of the muscles of vocalization, mm -hmm. the muscles of listening, the muscles of facial expressivity and of gesture, like we're doing right now, yeah. gesturing to each other. And these are linked to the nerve regulating the heart. So it becomes a co-regulatory, interactive regulation of autonomic state that enables our bodies now to be in states that support health growth and restoration. And when that system doesn't work, then we start seeing the behaviors and the symptoms associated with mental mm -hmm. health issues, mm -hmm. which will be mobilized behavior, rage, tantrums, anxiety. But what polyvagal theory really got its name for, really, was that when you study the evolution of the autonomic nervous system, you identify another defensive system, which is shutting down, which is passing out which in mental health is often dissociative states. Mm -hmm. So this uh, physiological immobilization with fear was not really acknowledged within psychiatry or psychology. They try to fit everything into a fight, flight, stress. And when you study trauma, that wasn't yeah, the issue. Yeah. So that's it in a... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for, uh, from my understanding, and also uh, uh, in, in our work as a psychotherapist, mm -hmm. for example, uh, I find it always very useful also to use your theory uh, to explain it to the people that mm. they understand their different reactions. Yeah. Because many people, for example, when they go in an immobilization yeah. state, uh, they are so, it's so uh, uncomfortable, also mm -hmm. it's so threatening, yeah. that they usually discount themselves very much. And in explaining to them that it is, in a sense, a uh, 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 evolutionary yeah. competence, so to speak. It's competence. Yeah, really, it's yeah. A competence. It's very relieving yeah. to the people. Yeah, I, I've watched this also as people learn about what their body does to protect them. Their personal narrative shifts from that of victim to one of survivor. Yeah. That this was a very positive yeah. thing that they did. And it's really quite amazing because we are so oriented 
as you know, Western world psychologists and psychiatrists to think of behavior as voluntary in having intention and being learned. But polyvagal theory tells us that there are a lot of responses that are functionally reflexive. They're implicit, they're within the body. And when our body reacts, then we start building these very complex explanations mm -hmm. which may have nothing to do with what our body yeah. did. Yeah, as if uh, uh, like a hypothesis on the, yeah. on the uh, cortex level yeah. uh, tries to explain what is uh, understandable in a very different way when you look with your theory. Yeah, yeah. and it takes, uh, because when people try to explain it, they say, why didn't I fight when I was held down? Or why did I just let the person abuse me? And the answer is, it wasn't a voluntary choice. Mm -hmm. Their body made this type of decision outside the realm of consciousness or awareness. This process I call neuroception because it's not awareness, it's not perception. Mm -hmm. It's a very rapid, implicit bodily mm -hmm. reaction. Mm -hmm. And all we need to do is think about the adaptive survival of this. If we were challenged and we thought about it to make a decision of whether we should fight or flee, we'd probably be dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's this adaptive for the species that our body had all these responses built in. And it's obviously context related yeah. to different contexts. Fight and flight is helpful for certain contexts, yeah. but the immobilization for other contexts. The, exactly. And the situation is sometimes we don't know how our body will react. And the, issue, the other part is our, our own history our own experiences as a child or as a younger adult or in workplace or in any other type of structure can influence. We can literally have learning through association that is also out of the realm of awareness. So when I had a dialogue with one of my colleagues who had a trauma history and my voice went to a lower frequency, she would go like this uh -huh. because my voice overlapped in her memories of mm -hmm. her father's voice. Okay, and then it, it, something is triggered then yeah. in a sense, and maybe the conscious mind still thinks what is going on here, and right. it's a silly reaction, but it's an appropriate reaction to mm -hmm. another context. The, the, exactly, and the, what I use the term, the beauty of the system, is the system reacts, and we feel the bodily response, but we don't know always what it reacted to. Mm -hmm. And so when, in therapy, what you're doing is allowing the person to appreciate the defensive, adaptive yeah. behavior of their body before they make a, an excuse or justify or a exactly. personal narrative. So this woman had the insight not to take the cue in her body to get angry at me, but mm -hmm. to take the cue in her body to say, it's what is reminding me of my father because I'm feeling this body response. So the important part of neuroception is that we are usually not aware of the cues, but we are usually always aware of our bodily responses. Yeah. And within therapy, we use terms like being hijacked by our limbic system or being hijacked. But what we're being hijacked by is the cues of our bodily re uh, reactions are triggering in our higher brain mm -hmm. that we need to do something. And this was very helpful, therefore I'm very grateful to you uh, developing the theory because uh, since I, I, I work with, uh, and, uh, with the relation to your work, I understood to, to bring to the people, for example, even if they don't know what's going yeah. on here, uh, uh, that they give a different frame to it. So yeah. as a, uh, let's say, so I, I feel something like I, I tend to be immobilized. I don't know yet uh, what's uh, a signal for, but certainly it's a clever signal, it's a, it's a competent signal, yeah. and then we have to recontextualize it, right. so to speak. And when we recontextualize, we respect it. Exactly. A and part of the effect of being traumatized is the disrespect for the body. And I actually use a term is that people feel that their nervous system failed them. They were mm -hmm. unable to mobilize and fight, and they're angry at themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And what they have to be is appreciative, love what their body did. And we're all pointing below the diaphragm, you notice that? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> the organs below the diaphragm mm. are part of this immobilization yeah, yeah. response. Yeah. So our neuroregulation of organs below the diaphragm 
is different than the newer regulation mm -hmm. above. Mm -hmm. Our fight flight system is up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our yeah, shutdown system is down yeah, here. Yeah. And now when we look at the symptoms of people who have had shutdown experiences, irritable bowel, digestive problems, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we see mm -hmm. all these issues here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's because the neural regulation below the diaphragm has been recruited for defense and not for homeostasis.